if the lion is the king of the jungle, how can he be the king of the jungle? If he's not the biggest, the elephant is probably one of the biggest. He can't be the fastest because that's a cheetah. He can't be the smartest. So he's not the biggest, the fastest, or the smartest. So how does a lion become the king of the jungle? His mentality. That's the only difference of a lion and an elephant. When a lion walks up and sees an elephant, he thinks lunch. An elephant thinks run. And it's all mentality. Because when a male lion walks up, he may be outnumbered by a pack of hyenas, but I'm king of my jungle because of my mentality. What happens when you're a gazelle and you're not being pushed? You're not being prodded. You're not giving it a reward. Nobody's encouraging you. What happens when you're a gazelle and the lion's not chasing you anymore? You stop running. But what happens when you're a lion? When you're a lion, it does not make a difference. You realize that if your family is going to eat, that if that pack of lions is to survive, then you gotta go hunt. A part of being a beast just ain't eating a gazelle. A part of being a beast is the hunts. It's the hunt that they're excited about. They like to see the gazelles run. Then boom, they take off. Cause real lions like to hunt. They love the process just as much as they love the prize. And some of y'all just want to score. You don't like the process. You're not in love with the process. A true hunter's goal is not the prize. A true hunter's goal is to hunt. That's what they live for. They live to hunt. They don't just live to catch it. It's the whole process. When you are a true hunter, you don't go by time, you go by the gazelle. When you are a true hunter, you hunt until you get a gazelle and you don't stop until you get one. And then you get another, and then you get another, and you get another. If you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do, be what you say you're gonna be, you're gonna have to lie me out. You a gazelle, you gonna come up short. You a gazelle, you gonna have an average experience. You a student, I need you in lion mode. You an entrepreneur, I need you in lion mode. You try to lose weight, lion mode. You can't do nothing significant in gazelle mode, nothing. Nothing impressive happens in gazelle mode. Nothing happens in run mode, give up mode, quit mode, scared mode, fearful mode, nothing happens. Everything happened in lion mode like I'm coming to get you. All right. I, I got to pump y'all up at the beginning of these calls, man. That is kind of my favorite videos. Bro, that got me <laughs> hype. That got Let's me go. hype. <laughs> All right. I know I'm inspired. Uh, yeah. Let's Ray go, Lewis. Maybe. Yeah. That was definitely. All right, guys. Me. This is definitely what, uh, what I like to call the lion mentality roundtable call. I know we all, some of y'all have been here before. Um, this is where we get together. We just shoot some shit. It's free flowing. Uh, we try to have some guests on every week to, to share some insights, to share some of their go-to trading strategies. So uh, we're going to let Adam Sliver kick it off tonight. I know this. I've been following the Sliver since the beginning of my journey on FinTwit. He was the first person I followed. And I'm just so glad to have you here, man. Man, that is an honor. Let me, let you, let me, should I get my screen share going? Let's see. Yeah, well, first right. off, I appreciate that that intro, man. That that means a lot. Um, it's a uh, it's been a fun journey, and you know we've got to see in the in the course of six to eight months the you know euphoria. Then what are we doing? And then we're going straight down, but it's not quite straight down. It's this managed selling type action where you know it's it's not just you know we're going to look back in six months and be like, man, that that went straight down. Why didn't I just hold puts? Um, but you know, we all remember that it's tough. I mean, this is tough right now. I'm, I'm sure all of you can agree. Um, uh, it's, they're not making it easy on us. And even when you get, um, you, you get one little push, uh, and you know, that either gets rejected or it turns into a big squeeze. So, you know, my main focus recently has just been patience just to keep, keep my head on straight, uh, make sure that, you know, I'm not, I'm not forcing any trades. And I know that the market's unforgiving. I know that, um, 
you know, one candle, one five minute candle can completely reverse the trend. Like you get a $1 candle on SPY, that's probably going to be a trend reversal, right? But, you know, if you're, if you're in puts at the wrong time or say you're, you know, if you're shorting bottoms and longing tops right now, you're, you're getting into a little bit of trouble. Um, but, you know, today we saw a very interesting action on SPY. Uh, got in, I mean, we rejected high or rejected kind of where we opened around 380, but interesting to see us go back down. So, you know, I want to start off by talking about uh, my main strategy, and it revolves around ATR, which is average true range of a given daily candle. And another great resource when it comes to this strategy is SATI, I believe, S A T Y. Mahajan, I, I think, uh, but if you just probably search Sati, you'll find them. Uh, but he has some great indicators as well that that are based off of ATR. And so, effectively, what what I do on a daily basis, um, and I'm posting my watch list, and I know many other people do similar watch lists, which is great. Um, I am just seeing, you know, what is the I use ten day ATR kind of just to say, you know, it's just an average top to bottom of this daily candle what's the move because the point you know of the strategy is i want to find given a daily chart usually start on the daily you know where can i predict uh, or can i try to get one of the days uh, that gives me that full move and so uh, when it comes down mathematically what i'm trying to do is you know with this candle here you see in the bottom bottom left right here atr is about three bucks and so this is roblox so you know my, i always wanted to find that sweet spot where where can and the what i have plotted here in this list of five this was my watch list from yesterday or today in fact um so what i'm doing is i'm seeing that okay the atr is three dollars but i want to find that sweet spot to where based on the close, and I'm not taking after hours into account, um, just because they don't necessarily matter, at least in my books. Of course, I'll plot pre-market highs and lows as levels, but for the most part, wherever the market closes, I'm kind of taking that number, so that $3 number, taking 20% of that, you know, 20 to 25%. So you know, you're looking at 60 cents-ish, a little bit more. Um, and I'm trying to find a support and a resistance that's that much, you know, maybe 60 to 75 cents away from the close. So that's just the math behind my watch list. And the reason for that being is because I want to give myself enough space to where I can ensure that there's still gas, there's still gas left in the tank uh, for, for a move. But, you know, I always get the question, do you ever play rejections? Do you ever play within the triggers? And you absolutely can. And a lot of people don't see, uh, you know, it just, it doesn't click yet for them. Maybe they're not seeing that it's a possibility, but, you know, obviously the main goal is if you get, you know, I trade primarily on the five minute chart. So I've got these levels, see, uh, from Roblox uh, yesterday. This is where market closed. So right about, right about 34 you see this trigger up here is 75 cents away, right there within my range. And you can see the reason that I did that is because we get this support here. We've got this resistance here, uh, kind of a few touches around this area. I mean, and for me, even three confirmations is, is good, but me seeing on the 15 minute chart, I'm getting four, five, six confirmations. I mean, I consider that a really strong level and it's within the range of price that I want. So that's great. Um, here, you know, I'm, I'm looking 60 to 75 cents and this is 65 cents away. And we get this kind of the low of day action here. Uh, it gets a little bit eh in there, you know, it's not perfect, but uh, you can see it holds up here and then it provided another uh, resistance there. But what I like to see is support turning resistance turning support again, right? You want to see as many flips as you can or just as many touches as possible. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, so as far as 
execution goes on these, you can't help. Um, oh, somebody tagged CT. Yeah, that good. Thank you for doing that. Um, as far as execution goes, I'm trading on the five minute. And there's a couple of mental notes that I want to make uh, on this. So in a morning like today, you know, you get the five minute candle that closes significantly below the trigger. And a lot of times I get asked, what are you doing in that situation, right? What I always think is, okay, suppose I buy puts here. What if the price goes back up and retest, which more often than not, it does. Um, if it goes back up and retest, where do you think I'm going to be at my position? Is my position going to be down 10, 12, 15%? Okay, well, then I'm basically stopping out. There's, I wouldn't take that, right? That should be your mental kind of, okay, is it too far gone? However, if this, say this candle closes at 33.25, you know, I would say, okay, I've got about 10, 20 cents of leeway before I'm stopping out really. Um, looks like a good place to take it. So this is a tougher one, obviously. But what's cool is that these levels are versatile, right? What I like to do, you know, even throughout the day, and Amazon has honestly been a great one recently, uh, seeing plenty of um, plenty of intraday, you know, even around lunchtime, it'll come back up or come back down and test the trigger. Uh, so you see here on Roblox, two times actually tests right here at the put trigger. And you can see, you know, if it rejects, goes back down below, you take the puts again, and you know, you get the exact pretty much to the penny retest there, right back down, kind of sort of get one here. Um, I guess you could have thought about drawing a trend line uh, from kind of like that. Maybe you could have played it in that way. But a uh, good example here of two perfect retests in the middle of the day that provided this level as, uh, as very useful. So um, I'll go through a couple others. Yeah, see, you notice Google open. I mean, it's high at open was right here. Uh, this one was kind of tough to, to get, but you notice right here, boom. Uh, retested the level. And I often get asked, how do you know when to enter on a retest? And I don't really think that there's a certain time limit. I'm not looking for any sort of candle close, really. I'm just looking for when it touches it, what's the, what's the velocity of the direction that it's going? You know, if it touches it and then quickly breaks above, obviously you can take calls from the break above this level. These are just pivots. It doesn't have to be strictly puts or strictly calls, right? But if you see it go up and then you see it quickly reject, then that's your retest enter. You know, you don't need any sort of candle closage. Um, oh, Satie's in here. What's up? He's the man. Uh, so yeah, that's actually a great example. Uh, meta today. So this is a, as far as playing within the triggers, and honestly, Sati, if you want to chime in on anything, uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, but my philosophy behind playing within the triggers is usually I try to identify if the day is a chop day. So say, you know, in the first 35, 45 hour of spy, you know, there's we're not making a new high or new low. There's no clear trend. And I've maybe got one or two rejections from a, a call trigger or a put trigger, then I'll probably think to myself, okay, the day's theme might as well be just chop. So the next time we get up to the call trigger, I'll take puts, right? So I, I actually grabbed puts up here, noticing that um, when meta came up, you know, got rejected. And I guess the level here, uh, I was mainly basing this one off of the wick up here. Um, I guess if I would have lowered it to, there's a lot of trial and error still. I mean, if I would have lowered it to probably there, would have been more precise, probably around the 165 area. But regardless, um, we see that each time it makes a, a pretty aggressive push upwards, there's big wicks, um, quick, you know, quick selling pressure. 
And then this volume spike right here actually was on news. Uh, they were talking about headwinds and honestly, lower guidance. I don't know why it went up a dollar off of that news, but it did. And you can see it gets within 15 cents of the call trigger. And knowing that there's been two, you know, two separate, three separate times where it just goes up and then dives. You know, I took puts up here today and they ended up being a really nice play. So uh, if you kind of identify a theme, uh, it can it can be very, very helpful to play within the triggers and kind of add that to your, um, let's take about five more minutes or less if you can. Yeah, happy to, I'll wrap it up. Um, and then, what was I gonna go here? Okay, so here's my levels for, for tomorrow. I've got meta again, which this is going to be a little bit more cluttered, but you can see trying to catch, you know, I try to keep it around round numbers. Um, psychological numbers are obviously really important. Um, so Facebook or meta is a, could have a pretty big downfall here into the lower, uh, into mid one fifties. Um, especially under this 160 level. I mean, 160 breaks and confirms down below. That's probably one of my favorite plays for tomorrow. Um, always a pleasure to watch Adam charting levels. Master at work right here. Thank you, Sati. You're, you're a master. You're just as much a master. How do I find my tickers? Yeah, feel free to ask questions in these last four, three minutes. Uh, how do I find them? A great place to start is the Unusual Whales, Hot Chains, and Tickers. I know a lot of people love that page. Um, it's really helpful to just see you know what's the point of that right you want to play stuff that's liquid you want to play stuff that doesn't have a super wide bid to ask spread right my general rule of thumb is if the bid to ask spread is 10 percent of the entire contract value i try to stay away from it so for example you know well chewy is borderline but y'all know i love chewy so I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet on the spreads there, but you know, you'll see chewy spreads that are 84 cent bid 94 cent ask, right. And that's 10 cents on a contract. That's not even a dollar. That's, you know, 12 cents the entire time. <clears throat> that's where I'm trying to stay away from. Uh, and then strikes, I try to go as far out as possible with while still being reasonable. And a lot of it is ATR based, you know, I'm going further out on Monday, Tuesday, and obviously Wednesday, particularly Thursday and Friday, I'm going pretty close to at the money. You know, tomorrow I'm either in the money or at the money or just the very next strikeout. Um, if anyone has one or two more questions or else. I, don't, um, I have one thing. Um, would you consider the ATR to be a realistic range for the day? I know that's kind of simplistic to ask, but a lot of people, you know, they see that and you know, then they go because they can't afford a, a, a strike that's, you know, within that range, they'll go further out of the money and then realize real quick that that was a mistake. Um, yeah. So uh, what, are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good, good point. And honestly, a lot of that can boil down to the ticker that you choose. So, you know, if, if that's the situation that you're in and you, you need to make sure you're watching stuff that's going to allow you to have affordable contracts, um, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't be playing Google, right? But the ATR is just top to bottom wicks, right? It's just the entire move of the day. It doesn't mean it's going in one direction. It means both directions, right? So say, you know, meta dips a, a dollar. You know, what's our ATR here on the daily? Uh, eight bucks. Say it dips $2 at open. Um you know, then you would think, okay, I might only have six possible dollars to the upside. And that's what I love about this math. It's because even still, you know, you can afford to have a dip down here, come all the way back up, and you still can have about $2 to the upside. You know, as far as the, as far as the contracts, I mean, you got to be smart. It boils down to the tickers that you play. I mean, don't play stuff that makes you uh go so far out that you that you won't be able to maximize it but on something like tesla you can probably play the two three hundred dollar contracts and it'll still move uh right it really is just a ticker uh, that... fair enough 
Well, thanks for the presentation, man. This was amazing. Absolutely happy. Um, this here. this was actually one of the, one of the first videos I watched was your first couple of videos on YouTube, and you talked a lot about this stuff. So y'all be sure to check out his YouTube channel. Um, I know that right now you're in the middle of the league. Is that correct? Yeah, we're just about to get started. I'm, I'm excited. Got to put some early time in, but it's uh, it's going to be a great month. I'm excited, man. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for your time. I know you're probably going to get out of here pretty quick soon. So we're going to go ahead and let him go, guys. Uh, thanks again for sharing. And we'll let Red Hot Trade jump in. Is that all right with you, bud? Yeah, that's good with me. Man, that was awesome. Right, man. I haven't thank seen Adam after. chart watch uh, his levels in a bit either. So that was cool to see. Much thanks love. again, Adam. That was awesome. Uh, okay, I've got to figure this out. Can I share my screen? <laughs> Can we, bear with me here. Technology, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> I am the worst. Trust me. Anyone that's in my Discord, uh, they could definitely attest to that. So it should, be at the, be... it should be at the bottom, I think. I don't know how it looks for everybody else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're good. Here we go. So I've got my screen sharing. Hopefully yeah, you guys can see, your, see my browser. See your, uh, yeah, we see your trading view browser. That's good. Perfect. Okay. So um, what I just drawn off here, I'm, I have a, a little bit of a lecture here to get before I get started on what I've got on screen with supply and demands. So what I'm going to be going over is supply and demand zones and how to recognize them, how to recognize uh, balanced market and how to capitalize on uh, changes, especially after today, like we had that gap down in the morning. And um, I'm sure that there were people who were buying calls, like all, if, if you look here, I'm sure there was people buying calls here because of this morning rally, thinking that it was just gonna go throughout the day and that we'd seen the low at the bottom of the day. But if you had played and charted out supply and demand levels, then you would have known that that wasn't going to be the case, uh, or most likely not going to be the case either way. This isn't going to be 100% foolproof uh, every time, obviously, or, but you know, it's, it's better to have a system in place and then to not have a system in place. And what I can show you here with supply and demand is how we can use this to take different trades. And then also I can throw a couple tips in here about fibs and how to use that for uh, supply and demand as well. So uh, just to start it off, just to uh, do an intro. So how markets work, right? Markets work by buyers and sellers, market participants agreeing on prices or not agreeing on prices. When market participants are agreeing on prices, they tend to be choppy. You start getting a day like yesterday where you can see here in this um, supply zone I have drawn off that you have lots of consolidation, lots of sideways action. Um, this ends up being uh, what you'd call a balanced market. This is when buyers and sellers are agreeing on price. So you're not seeing too big of a range here. And what happens when, when you see this, this is, most people will see this and be like, oh, this is a terrible day. <clears throat> We've got a choppy market. We've got no range. Uh, what am I supposed to do about this? And honestly, I like to see this because as soon as you see uh, the market consolidating, then you know that either a uh, supply or demand zone is forming and you're going to see an imbalance move at some point. And that's when you can capitalize and make a really good trade. So in uh, this case here from yesterday, you could see spy supply, uh, it traded within after it gap down, it uh, or leg down. It traded within this range pretty much all day. Had it drawn off here, this is a little too far over uh, to the last week of the day. Uh, this is on 10 minute. It's what I've been trading intraday lately, but this could go. You'll see different supply and demand levels depending on what time frame you're looking at. But uh, generally, this will be the area, even if I flip it to say the 15, you know you see that it's the same area, 30 minute, you can see it's the same area. It's just where it consolidated the most, right? So uh, before I scroll back down there, I think it 
it's moving. And let me know if I'm going too fast, guys, because uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these. Uh, but okay, getting back to what I was saying about balance and imbalanced markets. So when you have a balanced market, that means you have institutions buying up and uh, placing market orders. So they're and, and they're used to trading within that range. So yesterday we had uh, institutions buying up shares and uh, buying up positions here within this range, right? And then we gap down pre-market all the way down here. And uh, I'll show you what to do with this, with this after. But uh, so then we see it went for a leg up. It went for a leg up all the way here, all the way into where it was in its supply zone from yesterday or its demand zone from yesterday. Sorry, I think I've got, uh, I've got these <laughs> flipped here. That's, uh, that's silly. Okay, so yeah, this is the supply. This is the demand. So what ended up happening is you see support turn into resistance. And that happens whenever you have market imbalance and institutional sellers didn't get their cells to fill here because the market fell super quick, right? So you've got a bunch of orders left unfilled. And this creates an illiquid area in the market and or in the chart. So with this illiquid area, you're going to be looking for market makers to and institutions to get back in this area so they can sell out of that position. You got to remember that's uh, that's who's controlling these moves, right? And so they're going to push back into this. If they push back into this supply zone like they did yesterday, you could see it coming up and it went and it rejected the first time and you've got a decent leg down, even just from right here. Say it's um, what happened. This is like one o'clock today, right? And you saw that huge move down one o'clock EST for anyone central time, I apologize. So you see this big move down, you saw that you got this gap down. So you can, you can then determine, okay, this demand zone from yesterday where the market was extremely balanced has become the supply zone after a strong move down like that. So we can move this over and know if this price, if this candle gets back in this area again, I'm going to go short, right? Because you know that institutions are going to get out. They're going to fill their orders that they weren't able to get out of. And the market's going to dump. And you can see what happened after that. Everyone gets out of their positions. Algos get triggered. And boom, 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 boom. It drops down. And here we get a reversal, which actually happened to be pretty much around the 0.68 fib. So if you were to take your fibs and draw them from the swing low, oh, sorry about that. Take your fibs and draw them from the swing low to uh, the swing high. You can see that uh, the at price ended up coming here. I'll zoom in a little bit more for you guys. So yeah, with the fibs, I'm gonna this big arrow here. You can see uh, we had the the one drawn from the swing low to the zero to the swing high, and what you'd be looking at after, especially here, you see it. It respected the, the 0.5 and ran to zero. And this would obviously, even if you were playing fibs from uh, early on, say you had this drawn here once it hit top and then you knew that is your zero, then you could take pretty good risk reward plays on shorting it here, on taking a short on SPY with a stop somewhere, you know, at 381, maybe at the top of this previous uh, demand zone, which has become supply. So it gives you really good risk to reward plays here. And I'm just showing you the fibs added here for some extra context, because at the end of the day, you had uh, that rundown and some people would have been like, oh, I wonder why this bounced here. Well, it's because it came down and it tested off of key fib levels. This 0.786 level was respected bounced up and uh, bounced right through that 0 0.5, 0 0.68 fib and gave a nice chance to take some relief calls uh, even after that leg down. So even if we get rid of the uh, messy 
fibs that I have drawn here. You can see, and I bring this down, you can see what I'm talking about, right? Your demand was here, your supply was here. This was when the market was balanced. This was the gap down. We waited, you wait for the market to test previous demand. If it rejects here, institutions are most likely getting out of positions and it's a good place to go short. So that's a level that you can go, that's a demand zone that you can draw on your chart. This isn't, this isn't an indicator, but this is just something that I draw manually using a rectangle on TradingView. But you just, uh, and mostly another tip here for when you're drawing these zones is to look for the wicks of the candles. Like here, I base them off the wicks, not the bodies. So uh, just another tip there when you're drawing your zones. But yeah, uh, just some quick tips there on supply and demand. Uh, I had some other stuff prepared for unusual whales, but I think I've taken up a lot of time already. So I, I'd leave it up to Alan if he wants me to keep going or uh, if you want me to say- Let me just- uh... Let me just ask Mander real quick. Mander, do you have some time for him to cover some flow or do you need to- Yeah, yeah, I'm free, man. Go for it. All yeah. right, cool. Yeah, hey, get after it, brother. Okay. Um, all right. So just uh, the, the next thing that I wanted to bring up then was um, options flow and how to use unusual whales and a couple strategies that I've been working on lately. I don't know if, uh, how many people in the chat here or participants are using unusual whales or even if you aren't, this is- uh, it's going to be useful or maybe a reason for you to hop on and get uh, get on it. Code red hot if you do. <laughs> 5% off. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is just something that I've been working on. Uh, intraday options volume is a tab here that you can see on unusual whales. It's the very left here. It's this intraday and, and, uh, analyst, little guy in a uh, lab coat. And uh, I especially like using this to monitor and scalp, monitor options volume, and then use that to scalp positions throughout the day, or even take swings. If I see something that's pretty heavy and it's coming in maybe for some further out dates. So for example, uh, we've got FedEx on screen here and FedEx today, it was pretty bearish intraday options volume put to call ratio is 1.376. Uh, opening volume candle in the 10 minutes always going to be the highest throughout the morning. So you're going to see usually the most volume come in there. I usually tend to ignore that candle because uh, it just it's just mostly white noise from the initial rush of market open. But uh, as you can see, after a couple, uh, like an hour or so goes on, you can kind of get a better idea of how, or what level the 10 to put 10 minute put to call ratio is sitting at. So say if it's like sitting roughly around right here at candle open was at 0.91. And then the next 10 minute candles at 1.13. So not too big of a difference, 0.95, not too big of a difference, 0.65. Okay, we're getting a little bit more bearish here with more calls coming in, significantly more calls uh, or more bullish, if I said bearish. Uh, and then here, uh, flip back to bearish. And then this massive candle, this is what you would, I'd be watching for and go, hmm, what the fuck is that, right? Because you've got uh, this regular old put to call ratio all day and then 10 minute put to call ratio here turns to 15.845. So you gotta know, okay, something happened here at 1030. And uh, what you can do here is you can go to the flow feed just click by clicking the top right, like I did there and take a look at uh, the time. So from today uh, on FedEx, oh, oh I might have messed this up already. <laughs> Let me just go back here. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, so you go to the flow feed and uh, you'd want to take a look, right? So the the time that it came in was, what did we say? It was uh, just sitting around 10.30 this morning, EST. So you'd go in, you'd take a look at the flow feed, and you'd see what came in between 10.30 and 10.40 EST. And uh, you can do that easily by just going through your flow filter, uh, taking the today's date, uh, so is only today's date. Oh, oops. 
I'm doing this extremely slow now for no reason, but it really isn't this hard. Um, oh, man, don't, don't be nervous, okay? It's all right. Yeah, for sure. Here we got... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so from 1030, that's what we're looking at to 1040, right? From the 10, 10 minute put to call ratio. And we bring this up here. Of course, I did this two seconds earlier. All right, so we are seeing what's come in on FedEx from that time. And we're gonna go, what sticks out like a sore thumb here and why did that put to call ratio jump so heavily? So here we've got oh no. Okay, I think my computer is either either I'm an idiot or my computer's just doing something wrong when I go there. But the point of it is you go through the flow filter, you throw, you time in whatever time you see this at, you see what happened that was unusual there. Did a contract get hit? Did, uh, this is a lot of put volume. So what contract did they go after? And you can take a look at the contract in unusual whales, and you can even see what they're doing on the contract specifically. So, uh, for an example, we were talking about XLE, Earlier, I know that um, uh, Alan was talking about the energy names like Exxon and them going down. And it's something that we noticed earlier in Discord. These XLE 60 puts for September 16th got hit with massive uh, buys here at, uh, what was that, around, around 1240, 12.45. And uh, it doesn't really look like they've sold off these puts yet, uh, judging by the rest of the candle volume on these contracts for the day. Nothing really matched up with what we saw here. We'll have to see uh, some updated volume and open interest afterwards. But uh, you can even go through at the bottom, didn't mention this, you can just go through and also take a look at the time or the specific flow for the specific contract as well and see what's come in and who's buying what and how many how traders are behaving with this contract so that can help you uh judge your judge your sentiment like how am i going to go into this trade do i think if fedex has got if some whales taking a two million dollar position on 225 puts am uh am i going to follow them into this and it doesn't look like i sold them risk reward maybe not too bad so uh, usually flow plays are, you know, when, especially when you're finding them lately because there's a lot of millions of dollars coming through the filters lately. Uh, they can be a little bit less, um, you can be a little bit less confident than in normal market conditions. But if you pair this with regular TA, supply demand zones and stuff like that, then you're usually golden. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. What I wanted to cover with, Unusual whales. So, I got a question for you. Um, let's, let's stick right here. This with this chart for supply and demand. Yeah. Yeah. On the oh. graph. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so for for people that are see this shit, I'm talking about. I can see. It. Oh, whoa! <laughs> now I can see it. Uh, I see a big squiggly line. I don't know. That, I don't think that was me. <laughs> no, you some asshole. This happens all the time. Oh, okay. Okay. I got oh, is this a feature in Zoom you can draw in yeah. annotate? Oh. Yeah, it's silly. Yeah. Dick move, whoever. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't even know how to it off. Oh. Um, um I, I wish I could just uh here, let's just do this. It's even drawn on my other screens. What the fuck? I know it's the annotations thing. I'm trying to remember how to do it. Okay, I can see. I can see. Yeah, I found I'm the eraser. Not, not sure. I got it. I got the eraser. Don't come in my class fucking around. <laughs> I know, right? Jesus Christ, guys. All okay, right. Uh, my question is, is when you're looking at these supply rejections on like for today, 
And what candle yeah. are you taking an entry on? So is it just a wick up into it? Is it a five minute candle closed? You wait for confirmation. What's, what is your pre preference? So what I like to do is I like to, once I see the price approaching my zone, like I see it like today, when I saw it after the first rejection and we got that strong downward move on, uh, damn it, every time I move out this time frame, it's fucking moved up. So after I saw the first rejection on SPY uh, and it made this downside move and it went back in, this is when I took my position. So I just look for the retest of the supply zone to see if it, um, to see if it goes back there. If I can't get into the trade, um, just off this candle, most of the time I try and get into the trade. Like if I had leveled this off in the early morning, I'd usually drag this outward before this candle even got here, right? And just to be, just so I could keep my eye on it, like, is this going to go in this area? And then once this green candle popped in there, that's when it kind of took my eye, right? It popped into this previous demand zone. So I, I had that drawn or pulled over more to the side after this gap down to see, okay, is this going to retest now that it's lagging up? And once it did, uh, one entry, an obvious one would have been here, and then the second one here, which is the real good payout, obviously. Does that that make sense? Just looking, looking like I don't look for a ten-minute candle close in the supply zone. I just look for my price action to enter it, and then look for some kind of wick off. Like you can see here, where buyers got exhausted and it formed a bearish hammer. This is something that I look for. Okay, it rejected in the supply zone, it fell back. We have a, we have a question here. What time frame is better for supply and demand zone, shorter or longer? Depends what you want to do. Like to, like to me, if you're going to be swing trading, you should be using like hourly, four hour supply demand zones, taking a look at the daily and drawing your supply and demand zones off that. And if you're planning on scalping throughout the day, you're trying to the scalp spy options throughout the day, for example, and you're doing this, then I'd recommend using the 10 and the five minute. Sometimes the three minute you can get away with, it's going to be a little bit more finicky. It's going to be a little bit less uh, accurate and you're just going to, it's going to be too volatile. So I, I, I like to get nice 10 minute candles. 10 minute candles are my favorite, to be honest, especially awesome. with this current volatility. We get a lot of guys that use the five minute chart. Um, we had a guy, I know the stock sniper was on here. He used the one minute and he just, tra he trades in the last 10 candles. So that's kind of the point with these calls, right? Is you yeah. got to find a method that you're comfortable with. Yeah, and for sure. I love, I love the flow conversation because you can use the flow intraday and it is, it is absolute money. I mean, oh, when you yeah. see, when you see premiums coming in, you can jump on it. It'll, it'll, the premiums will move before the chart, kind of like NASA likes to say. I don't know if you'll follow him. Exactly. But the premiums exactly. will move and the chart will follow. Yeah. So it's a really cool strategy. And I liked that a lot. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate that. And uh, hopefully you guys like that. Awesome. Um, let's see. We got one more. How are you determining the height of your demand rectangle? Doesn't look like you're sitting on Wix or bodies. Uh, here I kind of draw it. I drew it a little sloppy here cause I was moving it around, but yeah, it should be, I, like I said, I like to draw it off of, um, off the top of Wix here. Sorry. I did this a little sloppy, like I said, but, uh, yeah, I like to go off of the Wix here. I saw it was trading within this really tight demand zone. Even you could probably bring it down to something like here and it would have worked out throughout the day, you know? You could have right. you got rid of um, this supply here and then just drawn that off. You could you could have went short anytime it went in this green box and made money today as long as you held you know through for a couple minutes, right? So uh, you might have gotten faked out on this like forty minute rally and then slight bounce, but then that dump out. You know, it's uh it's that's why. That's why here you gotta you kind of have conviction. You have to have conviction too. You see if it's entering the supply zone and it's not strong and it's not breaking out, then usually I I have full conviction in keeping my short position because I know at some point.
this is going to break down. Gotcha. And, and what's your typical stop loss after you enter a trade? Uh, when I enter a trade, I usually like to run different risks to reward ratios, depending on what sizing I'm running. It like, it really depends on like, if I'm running a full size position or if it's like a lotto or what it is, right. Lottos, obviously I'm just going with fucking anything. And, uh, but a regular position, my day to day, normally I go for a 10% stop and something like a 30% profit taker for my first target or 15% first target, 30% second, and then 60% third. Anything after that is usually just house money or just play money that I'm, I'm going with. I, I don't, I'm not the kind of the guy that goes with, uh, it's not house money at that point, but you get what I'm saying. I'm, I, I move my stops up. I make sure that I'm in profit and, uh, I, I stick in there and I, and I like to put that risk right at these levels too. So for example, if I'm going into a, a, a trade where I've got a, a stop and it, it's come into this range, maybe I'll go in with a 10 cent stop or a 10%, 15% stop when it's reached here and I see that it's gone out. And actually for an example of how this doesn't work out was, uh, cause I feel like that doesn't get brought up enough. Uh, today I did, let me see what time I sent this alert out. So earlier today, I went short on SPY. I took 374 puts. I had an order in for a dollar. I had a stop in at 89 cents. And I went for a target of 130 and 150. Um, then I got stopped pretty much instantly off of a fake out when we were going into that supply zone. But we just kind of consolidated a little bit too long. And the theta burn got to it. And it got me at that stop point at 0.89. And then I waited. So that was around 145. I waited another half hour at 213. I saw it re-enter around that same area. I was watching premiums and I entered the stop at 0.9. So just right where we stopped out previously. And then I entered another 10% stop loss at 80 cents. And then a dollar target, dollar twenty, a dollar fifty. And then that trade ended up ended up actually going through. So, you know, it, it's all about putting your risk minimal and then your reward like three to one, four to one, five to one. So you're always, you're always taking more than you're ever losing and your gainers will always outweigh your losers. Fantastic, and, uh, man. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, man. That was amazing. I really appreciate that. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's actually, it's nice to get it out. I haven't uh, done a longer form edu session in a while. And oh, that's this awesome, is, dude. Like this is uh so i've been following red hot trade for almost six months as well this this tonight's session is kind of nostalgic for me because this reminds me a lot of whenever i first got here <laughs> on on the internet and i mean i've been trading for a long time but but as far as trading options has been relatively new and i'm always learning something new and i feel like there are certain people out there that have true verifiable success with what they do and I'm not sure if you still have your Discord. You still have your Discord, right? Yep, 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 right. every day. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll be sure to hit up his Twitter account, check his Discord out. Um, this guy is, he's the truth, man. He really knows his stuff. And everything he's saying, um, I have heard multiple successful traders say. And a lot, of, a lot of people don't really know how to use supply and demand correctly all the time. They might have a zone or they might draw it up and then not really know how to enter or exit a trade off of it. So it was really nice to hear you hear you break that down. Hey, yeah, for sure. And I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, there's a lot of it's. It, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of you know hindsight traders out there, especially on Twitter. And I'm all about the intraday action. What's actually going on? Absolutely, sure. man. So do you uh, do you Thanks swing right now in this environment? Actually, you know what's the weirdest thing about that is. Monday, Monday, I had the, one of the worst days consistency wise I've had all year. I went one for six on day trades. And uh, usually if I'm even wow. like running a bad win rate like that, I don't push it, but I got kind of, I don't know. I, I, I got kind of emotional. I was like, fuck this. Why am I losing? So I just kind of buried myself and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it kind of made me switch over. I was like, and then I went in the next day and the first play I went on was a scalp on spy and I got hit. I got stopped out of that like pretty much instantly. And I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm taking swing trades. 
And honestly, I took, uh, let me look at the ones I did here. I did Zom 90 calls on the 27th and those ended up going, uh, or 90 calls uh, for, for the first. And uh, those ended up going very well that Zom ran to 92 the next morning and those puts went up like over 100%. And then my next swing, I went with target 145 the next day. Uh, I ended up getting at 165, took profits at $2. And then I swung Walmart last night for 118 puts at 110, got out some at 140. I'm still actually holding some. So yeah, I've, I've had some pretty good, I have some pretty good success swing trading in this market. You can do it. You just have to find the right plays. You know, well, and take them at the right time. I was definitely times. happy to hear about XLE today because I ended up swinging my Exxon puts in the close. And oh, I'm hoping, nice. I'm hoping those are going to pay. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, for sure. What strike did you get? I actually went with 82s. Oh, 82. Okay, okay. So I went a little bit further out of the money. For what um, For what day? For tomorrow. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You're the man. You're yeah. the man. Okay. I, I, I really I think, uh, I think it's going to break and well, you know, we'll see how it goes. If not, I'm going to cut it. Man, I'm rooting see, for you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. I'm rooting for you. Let's go. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, if y'all have any more questions, feel free to hit him up on Twitter, hit his discord. This guy is, is absolutely amazing. And I really appreciate you sharing. That. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. I hope to come on uh, sometime soon again too. Absolutely, man. We do this every week, anytime, but I'll be here. Um, Mander, what's up, dude? Not much, Alan. Cool to be here. Um, for everyone who doesn't know, I recognize a lot of the names here in the chat. Um, I just wanted to give the quick backstory because it's, it's surreal to me to now be on the other side of it. Alan was actually one of our very first boot camp guys. This is how I met him back in January. So this is this is super cool to me to now see the tables flip. Now I'm I'm uh, <laughs> in Alan's round table. It's just sweet, dude. I'm loving it, man. And, you know, you got to fall in love with this process. You got to commit. You got to get screen time. You got to absolutely commit yourself. And I think Kane Cap especially, I'm just going to give a plug because I can. Um, I was part of the OG Kane Cap boot camp. And this guy changed my world. So I am so honored to have you, man. Um, and I hope that you can drop the sauce for us today. I know you've been, you've been trading like crazy lately. So let's kick it off, brother. We yeah, haven't absolutely. anybody touched any kind of futures at all. Um, I was going to say, for a lot of the guys that were in the boot camp, um, I'm going to be going over, obviously, how I trade SPX and stuff on an ODT basis, because I'm sure that's kind of how I got most of my uh, following on Twitter was really those big percent gains. And don't get me wrong, they're sweet, but I kind of looked back about a month, month and a half ago, exactly what I'm looking at now. So I have an S&P 500 futures chart put up here. Uh, if you're going on thinkorswim, it's slash ES. And I'm looking at this like a month ago, we're trading like the 3,800 range. And I'm looking at this and we saw a thousand point sell off. And I just kind of looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, I felt like I didn't, you know, fully capture what I could have off this, like seeing a thousand point downturn in the S&P 500. And I'm looking at my port and as great as I did trading, you know, I feel like I didn't do as much as I could have. And so I think this is a really good time for me to hop on because I kind of reevaluated how I'd been trading. And I was really chasing those big percent gains, which is great, but I just felt like there was so much more I could be doing, especially I was going through my Twitter and I'm always posting, you know, SPX levels, outlooks and stuff. And I was going back even to like February and my outlook in TA was like spot on. And yet I didn't, you know, fully capture these moves because I was playing those ODTEs chasing the volatility. And I think it kind of comes back to what Adam was saying at the very start, right? Is that everyone knew that the stock market was going down. And kind of besides grabbing common share shorts, it really hasn't been just as easy as like buying puts and making money, right? Because the bear rallies are aggressive to the upside. And also what happens even intraday is when you have the VIX hovering at 30 or above, that's pricing in like a 2% daily move in the S&P 500, 2%, which is big. And we've had days where we've seen 5% downside, but for the most part at, you know, 2% daily priced in that implied volatility factor of your premiums is so high that you know, you could catch like a, a 10 point move to the downside, right? But you get like a five point move to the upside that lowers the VIX. You're now getting the bullish move against you inputs and the IV crush against your premiums. And so it's really hasn't been as easy as just like buying puts and just holding them and making money, right? Because the downside just exacerbated because of the IV crush on top of being wrong. And so it, it really just hasn't been as easy as 
like I was saying, like buying puts as easy as it looks, right? Like even the start of the year, the second we got this January sell off, everyone knew the market was, was going down. If you looked like economic factors, we were posting about this back in November. We all saw it coming, but it hasn't been as easy as it, it sounds. So one thing I've kind of added on to the bucket of my, my trading, and I always use this uh, analogy, the guys from bootcamp will probably laugh at this, but my thing is like as many tools as you can have in your trading tool belt, the better, right? You're like you don't want to be a one trick pony, even if you know, your one style of trading is great. Being good at multiple styles of trading is never going to hurt you. Like Batman didn't take down Bane with only the Batmobile. He's got all the tricks in the books, all the, the little gadgets. So this is one thing I've been trying to add on to my trading repertoire was going with futures. And so for those of you that don't know how they work, they're pretty much just a 50 X leverage. Like if you know, crypto leverage, it's basically 50 X plus or minus on uh on es and so you can also play minis which is slash mes and they just work on a one-tenth basis so a full-size es contract is 16.6 thousand i think like 1600 bucks give or take um it's basically like your margin requirement you picture like a down payment to get the contract and then it just goes plus or minus 50 dollars per point or you know five dollars and sixteen hundred dollars for the minis and so then the way it works is there's no theta decay there's no greeks you pretty much just like, if you want to get short, you get short. And if the S&P 500 goes down hundred points, you're plus 5,000, you could sell, you know, you get 21,000 back and change because of that margin requirement. So that's pretty much how they work. And so, you know, I was looking at this and um, I think this is also good. We had a lot of different TA styles on here, um, guys that were kind of given what they use to trade. So I would keep it pretty simple. Um, I'm a big Fibonacci retracement component. And then besides that, I pretty much use EMAs and MACD for both daily and intraday. And so a lot of times, you know, if I went on a five minute, I'd do this as well. I'm trading off, um, obviously eight under the 21 is going to be your bearish indication. Eight above the 21 is going to be your bullish. You can play your crossovers. And then I've been throwing in uh, MACD as well. Cause a lot of times your MACD crossovers will kind of forelude the EMAs and stuff. And you kind of see that move coming before your EMAs dictate or uh, solidify the, uh, the trend. This is one thing I was looking at, right? And so Going back on a year to date, we pretty much had this initial head and shoulders off this 4,200 neckline. And so, you know, left shoulder, there's your head. We broke through the 618 for a little bit. And then pretty much right off the 50 here at 4,500 was your right shoulder, broke neckline, flushed down to the 1618. And now at 3,800 was, the, you know, the target there. Saw a little bit under and there was our next rally. Um, really similar to if you guys follow the new guy we brought into Kane Capital, Mr. Trendwatch, he uses measured move targets. And so that would be as simple as, you know, um, S&P 500 rallied 400 points off the 4,200 low. So you get a 400 point rally off lows, low of 4,200 breaks. You're looking for 400 points below that for your next support at 3,800, you know, same exact thing and pretty much what happened there. Um, so that's kind of my trading style on a daily. And so I've been playing futures kind of on the back burner to try and supplement my intraday trading, because I'm sure a lot of you guys as well, right? Like we're in a bear market. I'm sure unless it's in a 401k or an IRA, like if you have an individual brokerage account, you're most likely not still holding longs. And so I'm sitting on a bunch of cash, not, you know, accumulating any longs yet. I want to be doing something with that. Like I'm not using hardly a fraction of my full port playing options. Right. And so I want to be able to do something with that cash to also make money. So we've been dabbling in futures here as well. Um, the ones I just started posting. So we kind of started dabbling once we got through this 4,200 neckline and the break where I was kind of getting comfortable with them. Um, then once I started posting, you know, we played back to this, you know, we got the bounce off 3,800. Where do we go? We retest the original neckline at 4,200 there, get our next flush to lower lows. Um, so this is one thing I've definitely added in recently that I know, you know, I've been putting some stuff on Twitter, but I know probably not many people have seen that. I definitely got the reputation for the, the ODTE SPX trades that are great. Um, swinging as well. I think that's a really good topic to bring up. I've actually been swing trading recently for the first time in a while. Uh, you know, honestly, since 2020, 2021, because back then, especially in a bull market, it was kind of hard to go wrong, right? You could come in three Mondays out of four in the month and buy NVIDIA calls for Friday and just hold them through the week and make 500%, right? It's so much harder now, like I was saying, because yeah, like we're not getting slight pullbacks into farther sells. Like we're getting aggressive sells into aggressive rallies. And so a lot of times what you're seeing as well, if you're trading options, if you're trying to chase that move in a bull market, you can get away with chasing because a lot of times it's just a slow grind higher. Like what's the saying? It's, it's stairs on the way up and then it's an escalator up and an elevator down in the stock market. So a lot of times you get the slow grind in a bull market to the upside. 
you know, you can chase the volume coming in and chase the move to the upside, still get away with it. In a bear market, you're buying into that high VIX, you're buying into the high IVs. And then, the, you know, it's not a quick pullback that we're seeing. We're seeing aggressive sells off a cliff. Like if I pull up SPX here, right, we had that consolidation just under 4,200. And then that isn't it. I need a dollar sign. Right. We had this consolidation. And then look at this. We, we had, saw a 400 point sell in three trading days. Right. It's aggressive and it's quick. And so if you're not front loading these, if you're not trying to get in the play before they happen, it's really tough to chase. And we've been seeing a lot of the moves happen overnight. That's another big thing. We've been seeing big overnight moves. And then we come into the day and pretty much just trade in a 50, 70 point range all day and chop during the intraday action and get our big moves at night. So this is, you know, all kind of things that have led to me adapting into this recently, trying to play, you know, get some swings in there. Um, the futures as well, trying to just do what I can to capture more than I have been because the thousand percent trades are great, but obviously in today's market, they're not as consistent as they used to be. Um, so, you know, doing what every trader we're trying to do and adapt here. So Here's a really great chart, I think, that will go over kind of my trading style and, and how I like to do these. Big Fibonacci uh, component here. Advocate, I guess I should say. So here was your aggressive sell at the start of the year on Amazon, right? You get your first bounce here. You double bottom off this 135 level. And then we get our rally pretty much back up to the 618. I plot these backwards and I'll show you exactly why. So I know this is 382, but it's just the reciprocal. It, you know, it's the 618 retracement if you're looking at it. Um, get our retracement back to the 618, strong rejection, third test of the neckline here, and a flush through, right? And so where's my price target? If we retrace 61.8% of the move, we break the neckline, I'm targeting the 1618. So let me go ahead and delete this other Fibonacci retracement. Perfect. That, so that's my next target. And what do you know happens, right? We get our bounce off there. We ride like 27 points off that straight into a head and shoulders left shoulder, head, shoulder. And so now right off of this recent one here was a swing trade. I know I've been putting this on uh, Twitter and everything. This is kind of how I've been navigating swing trades is that it has to be a great setup on a daily. Um, but we saw this recent sell right here to your third test of the neckline. We get a perfect rejection of the 618 here at 118. And right off this on Monday, um, I jumped in the 95 puts for the end of the month being that I'm targeting the 1618 on a break of the 101.43 neckline here, call it 102, and then obviously the 100 psych level. So pretty much like this two-point uh, demand zone that we've been seeing is holding up so far. We got, you know, this big hammer off of it today. But a flush through there is going to be my target, you know, right under 85. And we so we jumped in those at 73 cents. Obviously, at intrinsic value, if the price target is hit before expiration, we're looking at 10 plus on these contracts, the 95 puts. So that's kind of where are you going, Major? That was the end of the month. So I grabbed the July 22nd. Awesome. Gave, gave myself about three and a half weeks, I guess, four weeks when I took them on Monday. Um, you know, enough time to try and let this move fully play out. And that's one of the things I'm trying to adapt my style to capture more of the bigger move than getting so caught up in the intraday noise, especially now because it's so much algorithmic trading and stuff now. Like, you know, you, you focus on the five minute, which is what I trade on intraday. You know, I feel you get caught up in a lot of noise and a lot of BS candles and this, that, and the other trying to chase these weeklies or, you know, like if you're taking trades today for tomorrow, which we all still do, but you get caught up in a lot of noise and kind of miss like this bigger picture. So this is one thing I've kind of been, uh, you know, adapting my trading style towards. Um, and I think the biggest thing with that is giving yourself a good RR, right? Like I got these at 73 and they were down to 55 cents. Um which if you were using like a tight stop at 10%, like Red Hot was just in, you would have got stopped out of these. But you have to keep in the back of your mind with the risk reward you're getting with, you know, you got in these at 73, that's, you know, you're targeting 10 plus at your price target. That's like a 1400% upside. I'm obviously going to keep a looser stop. And so they went down to like 53, still held on to them. If anything, you can look at it like an accumulation phase. Like we did this on AMD as well, um, playing AMD monthly swings. Look at it more of like an accumulation. If you're confident in your TA, if the chart is still telling you that, you know, your trend that you're targeting is correct, right? I mean, we got in these on the rejection and we fell to the neckline in three days. I'm still feeling very confident about this trade. Um, you know, I'm not really worried about 20%, right? If anything, if I was wrong and we still stayed under 118 here, maybe we had, you know, one more green day before ultimately flushing. I just would have accumulated more. So that's one thing I've, I've been uh, leaning towards. So here's my question. What would make you exit that trade? 
So like I always say, right, the time I exit trades kind of versus, I always say play the chart, not the premium, right? And so like a lot of the times I'll have trades go down 40%, I'm still in them um, solely from a risk reward perspective, like I'm saying here, right? So instead of using like a 20% stop loss and stuff like that, that a lot of people will do, which I think is very disciplined and, you know, not something I'm ever going to shit on, but I like to say that as long as my thesis for the trade isn't nullified, I'm not too worried about the premium. And so instead of a hard stop on this, I would have used the daily candle close over my 618 at 118.25 here to stop out of these, right? If that was my thesis for entering was like the daily rejection of this 618, I'm going to wait until that thesis is nullified to exit the trade. And so that would have been my stop loss would be a, you know, a daily close above this level here. Fantastic. So I, I know we haven't really talked much since boot camp, but you know, I'll enter these monthlies, like knowing that I'm confident in my TA and, you know, I don't, I'm relatively new to options within the last six, seven months. Right. Um, and I am used to playing the chart. Well, you know, if I'm not sizing correctly, especially when you're new, that's a lot of people. Uh, Jesus Christ. It's like, don't full port, uh, uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was going too heavy and then I would get kind of, I guess, scared out, like kind of scared out of my trade, even though, and I end up being right, you know, and it's a, it's the worst feeling in the world to, to cut when you're 50% down just to see it work out. So it's nice to hear a perspective. Okay. This is what's going to, this is my foolproof plan. This is what's going to make me exit this trade. And I'm not just exiting willy nilly because I'm looking at my P and L. You know? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that you said there, and this is where I see a lot of people, and you know, I did this as well. It comes down to sizing, really, right? So, in this trade here, like if I'm looking at fourteen hundred percent upside on this trade, if it works out, you know, there's no need to go in these with a heavy size, especially knowing that, like, you're gonna like I was down twenty percent the very first day, right? And so, a lot of that comes down with sizing and sizing to the point where you can be emotionless, because especially in a swing. Like you could be wrong for a week straight until you're ultimately right. Like say you're early to a move, your TA is great. You're just early to the move, finally solidifying. Like had I gotten in these and we consolidated under this 3,800 level, like as long as we didn't close above it, I'm still, you know, feeling confident in the trade, but say I was a little early and we consolidated before flushing, the theta is going to hit these and I'm going to be down. So you kind of have to be in these positions, knowing the, the high upside kind of scale into these and don't go in a size where you're going to feel emotional like that. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And, and, you know, it's happened to me a million times is I'll be in a place size too heavy. I'm ultimately still right, but theta hits or, you know, like I was saying, intraday BS with candles and I scare myself out of the play and then they go like 500%. Right. And it's the worst feeling ever, like you said. So I think the biggest thing to that is sizing so that you're still comfortable being in the trade, even if you're going to be down. Right. So are, are you still using your similar 821 strategy intraday? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Nothing's really changed with me as far as TA goes. Um, okay. Which I'll go over for the people as well. I'm a big EMA advocate and I trade on the five minute. So let me, I did it again. So let's pull up a five minute. I'll show you exactly mm -hmm. what I'm looking at. I pretty much trade going off EMAs. Today was a tough day here. Um, try and pick out a couple ones where this would have worked, but for the most part, this looks pretty brutal. Mm. All right, we'll take, we'll use this for example, right? This will kind of play into Ripster's EMA clouds. I like adding at the EMAs, but you could do this on a cloud as well, right? Uh, here's your bullish sign. Like I was saying earlier, you, a lot of times you'll get led into a trade earlier with MACD than you would on EMAs, because if you're playing the EMA strategy, that I do. So my gold line here is my eight and my purple is my 21, right? And so eight under your 21 is going to be bearish. You get this crossover to the upside. That's your bullish indication. And then at that point, I'm waiting for a retest of the eight or the 21 and a bounce to then get long. Um, obviously this played right. We filled this played right to the gap fill. Um, you can see right there, we filled the gap and then pretty much reversed off that. Uh, but you had your, your bullish signal and your MACD here all the way at 1030, didn't get your EMA crossover until 1115. So that's one thing I've thrown in probably since I've talked to you guys is trying to utilize five minute MACD um, to kind of get me into a trade earlier. So if I saw this bullish crossover on MACD, I probably would have waited to see the 21 break first, just to make sure we didn't break the eight and reject off the 21. But probably somewhere in here, we're getting some strength above the 21 like this candle probably would have been a great ad as we kind of flagged off the 21 break towards the eight. 
Um, but I'll go over a trade I actually just took two days ago, I think was a, a much better example to kind of detail my trading strategy. Um, this was Tuesday, if you guys remember, we had a really strong trend day with a lot of selling pressure. Um, rallied aggressively at the open and then just a complete flattening and reversal. So this was obviously, you know, you could have bought puts probably at any point and held and made money. Uh, but my biggest thing is never wanting to chase the red candles as you get extended from the EMAs. And so once we saw this flattening out, right, like this wouldn't have been for me, at least the way I trade, this wouldn't have been my put entry because I don't have anything above. I have all these EMAs for support underneath. I would have been waiting to see a flush through the EMAs and then a retest. So you can see here, we get this flattening at the top of the day. We start flushing off of this. Couldn't really break 3950. Um, flush under all my EMA support. And then right here at 1030 is where you got your EMA cross, right? This is your bearish indication that eight comes under the 21. And so at that point, I'm waiting for a five minute retest and rejection of the eight, which we got right here. Um, so I unfortunately didn't grab puts here, but this would have been in hindsight, you know, an ideal ad. But at this point, once I missed this rejection, you know, this 15 minutes here before the flush off the eight, um, I'm again, then just waiting for a pullback. So we actually got a bear flag. I mean, now we're down hundred points from daily highs. Uh, but I didn't see any bids really coming in all day. So at some point I was figuring, you know, lunch hour, afternoon session is going to come in. We're going to get some type of pullback and I'd like to see a rejection off the 21, which we got right here. And so because we didn't, I was going to hammer these at the 21, we didn't quite make it there. Um, but we got this flush back under the eight. And so on this green candle here, now we're back under the eight with all these layers of EMA resistance above. Um, I grabbed the 30, 3830s right here at the top of this green candle as we tested the eight. Um, got really lucky with my flush. This is another thing to talk about because I know Red Hot was going in on the correlation between stop loss and uh, price target, right? A lot of times I keep looser stops, but when I'm playing SPX ODTEs, and this is going to be crazy to a lot of guys who don't know my trading strategy, I'm shooting for 100% price or 100% profit on every single trade or else I'm not going to take it. And if you've traded SPX ODTEs, you know, as crazy as that sounds, it's very realistic because the way these premiums move is nuts. Um, my whole strategy you is- You get 100% in seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're right in the move and your entry is good, you get 100% really fast. So my whole thing is with these, especially being cash settling, is if you take a realistic strike- my whole thing is to try and get to 100%. I trim half, and at that point, it's a risk-free trade. So if I, you know, they double and I sell half, now I took all my initial capital out. I'm playing with, you know, it's a free trade. I'm playing with free money. So at that point, I'm waiting to see if I took a realistic strike. If these get in the money, they close at intrinsic value. And so these, for example, I took the 3830s and we closed at 3821 and some change. So these closed at eight bucks and some change per contract. So you can get crazy returns on these because they close at intrinsic value. So if you get a really good ad, um, a lot of times it'll be on like a big flush. If you take an ad deeper out of the money, you can get in these for, you know, a dollar, $2 a contract and they close 20 bucks in the money. There's a hundred thousand percent trade. Um, so that's always my biggest thing. And at that point, you know, this one didn't work out. And I tweeted about this, right? At, at one point here, um, I had it been right here, this 240 candle we kind of consolidated into the close. I can't timestamp it on here, but this flush is actually the next day. Um, right here is the close. At this point, you can see we pretty much traded sideways all through power hour. So here they were at 14 bucks a contract. I got these 3630s at 205. So they were up 600%. They closed at 826, only up, you know, 300% and, and some change. So, you know, does that suck? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't time the perfect exit. Um, that's unfortunately just the double-edged sword of holding these into the close playing for those big moves, right? Cause at the same time, two weeks ago, we had a 2000% trade where I held these into the close and they, you know, they flushed into the bell, um, and closing at intrinsic value just provides you that, that crazy upside. So again, it, it's really comes down to trading strategy, trading style. I just know for me personally, that getting those huge trades is ultimately going to pan out for the ones that don't hit or the ones I don't time and exit like that, where, you know, they were up 600% and they closed out 300%. You know, I know in the long run of doing it, when you catch those big 2000% trades, it makes up for all the times that you give back profit like that. So that's kind of my trading strategy as crazy as it sounds um, for ODTEs at least. And then, and then the swings we covered as well. Man, I really appreciate you sharing. This is, this is money. Are you, are you enjoying, what do you think? Do you, are you enjoying futures trading more than options now? Seems like you're really digging it. 
I'm really loving it. I, you know, nothing, nothing beats seeing some crazy ODTEs and like, you know, oh, a lot yeah, of Friday, you know, lot of Friday comes and you're having a great lot of Friday. Everything's hitting. Nothing's ever going to top that because the returns aren't the same, right? Like you're not getting thousand percenters in a day, but I am loving it for the fact that it's not as volatile. It's simple. There's no Greeks and, you know, premium calculation I have to take into effect. There's no theta. It's simply, you know, I got short here. This is my price target. You know, I'm not squeamish. I'm not going to get stopped out on some random green day. Um, right. It's it just, it's a lot less stressful than it is options trading. So I'm liking it on the back burner, right? Like I'm not devoting everything. I still, I'm um, options trading number one, but I'm really enjoying futures trading kind of supplemented on top of that. I appreciate it, man. Red Hot, did you have anything else you wanted to add uh, or ask Mandra about since we're on the call? Uh, no, I think that like, um, no, I think that it was, that, that was crazy. So much, so much good info from you guys. Like, <laughs> yeah, this was awesome. I don't even Fantastic. know. I, I loved hearing everything that you had to say, uh, especially with your EMA strategy and um, I, how you like to uh, use your risk and reward. It's just, uh, it's just like how I like to trade too. So yeah, it was awesome guys. Hope, hopefully everybody can see some commonalities and some of, what, some of what these guys are saying. Everybody that's on these calls, they all have a plan. They all know what they're doing before they do it. They're not just jumping into momentum, you know, so I hope that people can understand that, that there's a lot of dedication that goes into the process, which is why we call this the lion mentality. You know, like you got to be dedicated to the process of learning this stuff. And I highly encourage everybody to follow Money Mander on Twitter. Um, they're going to be their deadline for their next boot camp is I believe next Tuesday. So, you know, I mean, it's only a thousand dollars. So y'all get on it. I'm telling you, it's worth it. I'm going to totally plug it right now. I don't give a shit. It is absolute money. <laughs> and you're talking about some serious, serious dedication for hours on it for these guys. And it takes a lot of work. So I really appreciate uh Amanda coming on. Dude, you're you're one of my freaking idols, man. I'm telling you, you're amazing. Oh, I appreciate all the words, Alan. And thanks for the thanks for the shameless plug. Um, yeah, like you said, <laughs> boot camp signups ending uh actually fourth of July. It starts Tuesday. We brought in Trendwatch, um, 40 year floor trader off the stock exchange guy makes us, you know, if you were to listen to this, he makes us sound stupid. So um, I'm yeah, honestly, sure. I'm excited. I'm going to be attending all his classes myself, yeah. but awesome. I think go that was feed really the good. Ducks, go, uh, go chop some wood, chop some wood milk, milk, whatever. Milk the cows. <laughs> <laughs> and props to you. Yeah, that was man. a really good round table. I think you brought in a lot of great traders that all trade with different styles. So I think that was really good Thanks. for everyone to, uh, you know, see and hear from. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to post, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording here. We've been a lot longer than expected, but I could not stop it. This was amazing. Um, I'm going to post this to you, my YouTube channel, guys, for, you know, for everyone to go back over and review. Thanks again to Money Mander. Thanks again to Red Hot and Sliver. I know he jumped off, he had an appointment, but uh, absolute amazing information. And I look forward to seeing y'all next week, guys. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you. All Have right. a great night, guys. All right. We'll appreciate see you it. later. Talk to you soon, Alan. Later, buddy.